Take your Bible, please, and go with me back to the Gospel of John, chapter number four this morning. John's Gospel, chapter number four, and we're going to be looking at verses 31 through 38 in the Scriptures this morning. John chapter number four, and I will begin reading in just a moment from verse number 31. If you are able, I invite you to stand with me for the reading of the Scriptures. John chapter number four. John 4, verse 31, it says, In the meanwhile, and I'll come back and explain what's been happening, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Say not ye, there are yet four months and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages And gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors." Would you pray with me, please? Father, I thank you for the scriptures, the holy word of God. I thank you that we have a copy and we can open it and read it and understand it. I thank you as a believer this morning in your son, the Lord Jesus. I have your spirit who lives in me today and he wants me to have greater understanding. And so I pray that you will challenge us through your word and by your spirit this morning. I pray for every person who's sitting in this auditorium and anyone who's with us online. I pray today that you would have our full focus and attention and that we would allow you today to truly lift up our eyes and see the nations. Lord, would you today do a work that is an eternal work in our lives? There's someone here today like the woman in our text that doesn't know you. May today they come to the understanding of their sinfulness and their need of you as a Savior. May they believe on you today. We ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much for standing. As we began this year's World Missions Conference, God just continually burdened my heart with this text of Scripture. As we think about see the nations, as we think about looking out on the world in desperate need of the gospel light. John 4 is one of my favorite accounts in the life of the Lord Jesus. I just thoroughly enjoy this. I just preached from this text, another portion of it, uh, just a couple weeks ago in our Spanish service. And I I, uh, just uh, love this, this portion of Scripture. It is one of the most amazing encounters in the life of our Lord. If you'll go back with me to the beginning part of the chapter, would you do that just a moment? And and look up with me in in verse number 4. It says in John 4, 4, And he, that's Jesus, must needs go through Samaria. Now, that's not the route that the average Jew would take if he were going from where Jesus was Israel was divided into three provinces. If I could picture in your mind up here, at the south part is the Judean province. In the middle part is Samaria, which is where our text will take place. At the northernmost part is Galilee. Along the east side of the of the land of Israel runs the Jordan River, and and the average Jew, in order to trans 
transpose himself from, transport himself from Judea to, to Galilee, we would leave Judea, go across the uh, Jordan River into a land called Perea, and would cross again uh, the Jordan River to get into Galilee. You say, why in the world would not they go the straightest route? The shortest distance between two points, I did take geometry, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. But, but they would not do that because in Samaria lived Samaritans. And they had no dealings with the Samaritans because the Samaritans were people that had become mixed. They were not just pure Jew. They had married with Gentiles after Assyria had come down and conquered uh, that northern part of their country. And so the average Jew had disdain in his or her heart toward a Samaritan. But you know, the Lord Jesus, he has no prejudice. Aren't you glad this morning that when Jesus looks down at us, he doesn't see us by our nationality? He doesn't distinguish us by our language? He doesn't categorize us by our economic situation? Aren't you glad that when, when Jesus looks down at us, he sees no difference? Amen. I love that little children's song, Jesus Loves the Little Children. All the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. <laughs> but you know what? He, he loves big children too. <laughs> he even loves ornery adults. <laughs> I mean, Jesus doesn't, he doesn't see you the way you may even see yourself. He certainly doesn't see you like other people see you. I'm glad that the God who made us sees past the external into the internal because he knows what's really important is the eternal. I'm glad this morning that, that our God does not have in his, his spirit one ounce of prejudice. He went there, verse 7 says, because there was a woman of Samaria coming to draw water. And Jesus starts off a conversation about water, but he really wasn't interested in the physical water she could give him. He was interested in her drinking spiritual water. But before he would get her to the place where she would recognize her need, he would talk to her about her own wickedness. He would talk to her about her own worship. And, and ultimately, look down to verse 25. This is what the woman says. The woman says unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. And when he is come, he will tell us all things. She's, she's at the point now that she realizes that the one she's talking to understands things that everybody needs to understand. And verse 26, I can't even imagine what it would have been to have been there and heard from the lips of Jesus these words, I that speak unto thee am he. Wow. Now it's not recorded, but somewhere between verse 26 and verse 28, she believed on the Lord. And verse 28 says, The woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city, and saith to the men, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? <laughs> yeah, I bet you that went over big. It did. <laughs> verse 30 says, Then went out of the city and came then they went out of the city and came unto him. Verse 39 says, And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified, He told me all that ever I did. That's the context of this morning's text. This woman meets the master. And her life is forever changed. 
If you're here this morning and you've never placed your personal faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior, can I just tell you that he will do for you what he did for this woman? He will save your soul. He'll forgive your sins. He'll give you the gift of eternal life. And he'll drastically change your life. Your life will become a life of peace and a life of purpose and a life of joy because it's a life about Jesus. You say, Pastor, what does all this have to do with us? I believe you and I stand on the threshold of what could be the largest ingathering of lost mankind to Jesus Christ in church history. If, if, if the statistics I have read and I checked them as late as this morning, there are over 8,176,000,000 people living on the planet. We, we have more opportunities to share the gospel than we've ever had. We have more means, more methods, more open doors in more countries to preach the gospel than has ever been for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you look across America, all of the problems and all of the perplexities that have invaded our wonderful and blessed land have made us the most discouraged, disillusioned, depressed people in our nation's history. There are more people on some kind of drug to try to give them some kind of peace than there's ever been in the history of the United States. So, so the question this morning is not, well, is there an opportunity for us? That's not the question. The, the, the question this morning is, will we rise to the challenge that is before us? Will we seize the, see the opportunity and seize the opportunity? I want you to look with me in our text this morning at three aspects of the law of the harvest. Our theme verse for this week's meeting is that 35th verse that we read together a few minutes ago. And in that 35th verse, Jesus makes this statement. He says, he says, uh, lift up your eyes and look on the field for they are white already to harvest. What, 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 what must we do if we would seize the opportunity? Number one. Let's talk about the passion we must seize. The disciples have gone into town to get him something to eat. I didn't read it a few moments ago, but look up in verse 27. It says, and upon this came his disciples. Marvel that he talked with a woman because uh, men and women didn't talk, and particularly Jewish men with Samaritan women. Yet no man said, and what seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? And verse 31 says, In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed to him and said uh, to him, Master, eat. And he said, I have meat to eat that you know not of. And so they start thinking, okay, who, who, who got to McDonald's before we got to McDonald's? I mean, somebody must have went and got him a Whopper at Burger King. What, what do you mean somebody brought you something from Cracker Barrel? Uh, you know, whatever it is. I don't know how he got the food. But somebody's brought him food. They, they, were, they were kind of perturbed. Here, here they are, good Jewish men. They've even, they've even ventured into Sychar with a bunch of Samaritans and have gotten food, probably been looking to make sure it was permissible for them to eat. We were just recently on a mission trip to Dearborn, Michigan, and kept seeing this word. I've seen it before, but I didn't really know what it was. But it, it's a word that means permissible for Muslims, that they can, they can eat the food in that restaurant. And, and so probably, probably these men have gone in and looked for kosher food and, and they've tried to find something that they could feed Jesus. And they, they, get the, they get the meal together. They bring it out there to him. And when they get there, somebody else has fed him. When they left him, he was weary and tired. They find him refreshed and invigorated. When they left him, he was hungry and thirsty. They find him satisfied and thankful. All they could think about was the temporal Jesus was focused on the eternal. All they could think about was lunch. Jesus was focused on love. See, when the, when the work of God becomes a greater passion to us than temporal food, 
we'll see a difference in the tremendous harvest of souls. What, what, what if you and I witnessed with the same passion that we eat? I would dare say that very few of us have missed a meal in the last seven days. Matter of fact, not only have we not missed a meal, we got a snack in between the meals. We got something to eat. I went to a restaurant this week that I've kept hearing people talk about, and I went to eat there because I, I love Eastern North Carolina barbecue. I wasn't raised this part of the country, as you know, but, boy, I'm telling you, from the top of my head to the sole of my feet, I'm Alabama-born, Alabama-bred, and when I die, I'll be Alabama-dead. But when I get to my stomach, I'm Eastern North Carolina barbecue, okay? <laughs> Whole hog, eh, man? I want the skin chopped up in it. But you, you, know, you know why I went to that restaurant? I went to that restaurant because several people have said to me, Pastor, have you been to? Why? Because every one of us have a natural passion to eat. What if you and I were as hungry to share the gospel as we were to eat this week? What difference would it make? What, what, if, what if we pursued the lost souls of men with the same fervor that we invest in our earthly gains? Could, could it be this morning that you and I aren't seeing what we ought to see in, in the harvest that's happening around the planet because we have become more interested in temporal things of this world and have forgotten the eternal priorities of life? Jesus made a statement to them. I have meat to eat that ye know not of. You, you know what? From the cradle to the cross, the burning passion in the heart of Jesus was to do the will of the Father. He says there in verse 34, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. He said in John chapter 5 and verse 30, I can do of my own self, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which sent me. He said in chapter 6 of John in verse 38, For I came down to he from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. He said in John chapter 8 and verse 29, And he that sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. Listen to him in the garden. Oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Three verses later, it says he went away again the second time. Prayed, saying, oh, my father, this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it. Thy will be done. Then Matthew 26, 44 records he left him and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. You know what Jesus understood? Jesus understood there was one passion worth living for. That was the will of God. I want to ask you this morning, how deep of a burning is there in your heart to please the Father? The, the reason you and I aren't involved in harvest work of sharing the gospel and preaching the gospel and testifying the gospel, it isn't because of all the excuses that we make up. I believe the number one reason that it is not what it ought to be in my life, in your life, is because there's not a passion burning within us. I must do the will of the whim that sent me and to finish his work. Jesus would say himself in chapter 9 of John, I must do the work of him that sent me while it's yet day. The night cometh when no man can work. I don't know when my life's going to end. You don't know when your life's going to end. But when it ends, I want to be found faithful doing the Father's will. 
you and I are going to be involved in the harvest, number one, there must be a passion that we seize. Number two, the people we must see. The people we must see. Look at verse 35 again. I know we've already read it twice. I, we read it together. I've read it. But look at it one more time. He says, say not ye, there are yet four months and then come a harvest. Let me explain what that is. I understand that that was a very familiar Jewish proverb. Uh, the image of the harvest, they would, they would say, you know, well, it's four months before harvest comes. Harvest never gets here before four months. It's just, you know, in other words, you, you don't have to do anything about it today. It's going to happen. And, and, and I'm afraid that the reality is that's the way many of us as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, many of us view what is happening around the world. It's going to happen. I'm not so interested in just it happening. I'm interested in being a part of it while it happens. I, I'm the kind of guy, I want to be in the middle of it. You know, when I go to a ball game, I never sit there passively. I've even gone to ball games where my team wasn't even playing. And I chose a team just so I could yell, just so I could scream. Just so I could jump up and down. Man, don't look at me like you're pious and you ain't never done nothing like that. I, some of you are thinking, oh, I know, I know. <laughs> I mean, I can see two ants on the ground and I'll draw a line and cheer for one of them to win, beat the other one. <laughs> It'd be an awful thing. Stand at the judgment seat of Christ. Nothing in my hand to bring. We used to sing when I was a little boy in a little country church I grew up in. I sure didn't understand it. Must I go an empty handed? Must I empty handed go? Not one soul with which to greet him. Must I empty-handed go? I had no idea what I was singing. But when I did, when I learned, when somebody taught me, when somebody told me, that I was supposed to be participating in the evangelization of the world, I'm telling you, I jumped in with both feet, and that's been 50 years ago, 50 years ago. And I haven't done, and I haven't seized every opportunity God's given me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be ashamed of that, but I am so grateful. I am so grateful that I've been able to do it a few times. How do you do it, Pastor? The problem is not the ripeness of the field. The problem is the blindness of the workers. Jesus said right here, Say not ye there yet four months and come harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. Now listen to me. That primary application was what was happening there. We read it a while ago, verse number 30. Then, went, then they went out of the city and came unto him. Verse 39, many of the Samaritans of that city believed on her, believed on him for the sake of the one which testified. He told me all things ever I did is not this is Christ. Here it is. Jesus is sitting on Jacob's well. Disciples are gathered around him trying to get him to eat. He said, I got meat to eat you know not of. I mean, so do the will of the Father, finish his work. And he said, fellas, don't say there's four months and then comes the harvest. Lift up your eyes. I, I, think he looked, I think he stood and pointed right towards Sychar, where they had just been. He said, lift up your eyes and look on the fields. Hey, you know what? There, there's, there's 
multitudes of people leaving that city, coming out to where they're at. But I can tell you this morning, here it is for me and you at Beacon Baptist Church on September the 15th, 2024. Lift up your eyes. There, there's not a state or a country represented in any of these flags that doesn't need another gospel witness. Some, sometimes we, we hear about there's multiple missionaries in wherever. Just choose wherever. I'll, I'll choose the Philippines. I'll choose Brazil. It doesn't matter to me where you choose. There's multiple witnesses there. Do, do, you, think, do you think everybody in Brazil's heard the gospel? Do you think everybody in the Philippines has heard the gospel? But let's pick on right here. Do you think everybody in Nigeria has heard the gospel? That's right. That's right. Good. You, you know what? When the, when, the, when the last person is evangelized on the planet, our work's done. But until then, there's people we got to see. There's people we got to see. I heard about a sales manager gathered his sales force one day and drew a black dot on a big white board, a four by eight board, one little black dot about the size of a quarter. And he said to his salesman, tell me what you see. And they all look at each other like, bless his heart. He don't know what we see. Finally, one of them gets up the courage and says, I see a big black dot. He said, okay. Anybody else? Tell me what you see. Well, another one says, well, sir, I, I see the same dot. <laughs> He said, okay. Anybody else? Tell me what you see. Finally, all of them just kind of, you know, sir, we all see a big black dot. He says, so none of you see a big white board that you could put a lot of black dots on. When you go to work tomorrow, what do you see? A cantankerous manager or a lost soul for whom Jesus died? When you go to school tomorrow, what do you see? A, a fellow student or maybe a, a student of yours if you're a teacher? Or, or do you see, a, you see a lost person that Jesus died for and would save if you would tell them about him? Tell, tell, me, tell me what you see when you go home this afternoon on your cul-de-sac. I see a neighbor hard to get along with, Pastor. What a difference Jesus might make in their life. Your apartment complex, your mobile home park. If Jesus can make that statement 2,000 years ago, what in the world would he say if he could talk to us audibly this morning? Do you understand there are over 25 times the people living on planet Earth today than were alive when Jesus was alive? They estimate the population of the world in his lifetime would have been about 300 million. The population of our world is 8 billion, 100 million plus people. Do you understand two out of every three people on this planet this morning have never been confronted one time with an opportunity to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you understand this morning that there are 5 million 200, uh, 5 billion 200 million people living who never had the opportunity to say yes or no to Jesus Christ? If just 25% of those people trusted Jesus, there would be an ingathering of souls of about one and a half billion. If you and I are going to be involved in the harvest, there's a passion we must see, so there's a people we must see. And thirdly, there's the partnership we must share. It's interesting, Jesus turns the conversation, I believe, directly to these men. I believe Jesus looks these 12 men eyeball to eyeball. And he says these words. Look at it, verse 36. And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal. That's what we're talking about. This whole subject, this whole subject about world missions is about life eternal. Where will people spend forever? Will they spend forever in heaven or will they spend forever in hell? 
He that reapeth receiveth wages gather fruit and life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap there whereon ye bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors. We don't do what we do for reward. We do it because we love the Lord. But you know what God does? God rewards his labors. And you know who receives the reward? Newsflash. <laughs> Those involved. And you know what God does? He rewards us all the same. Think about it. What we like to do, and I'm telling you what I like to do. I went out yesterday with a group of, of, of men and ladies from our church, and we canvassed the neighborhood and tried to share the gospel. And, and you know what I want to do when I go out on Saturday morning at 10 o'clock? I, I, I want to go out, and I want to see somebody get saved. I want to be there when they pray. I want to be there when they trust Christ. And that's what I want to be, man. I'm telling you, just if you've got anybody set up, ready to be saved, let me know, okay? But you know what? It's not just he that reapeth that receiveth. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus says, he that reapeth, but also he that soweth. Our Lord says both will be rewarded. What a lesson on partnership in this matter of evangelism. And I believe, you remember the setting, Jesus on the well, stands up, lift up your eyes, look. And I, I, I believe he looks right at these men's eyes and he said, listen, you fix to reap where you bestowed no honor, no, no labor. You, you, you know what Peter, James, John, Bartholomew, Andrew, Philip, you, you, you know those boys are going to be able to be, they're going to be able to get in on the reaping because there was a multitude coming from Samaria that needed to know the message of the Messiah and, and yet they had bestowed no labor. They didn't do anything. Matter of fact, honestly, okay, let's just be honest. They may never have vocalized this, but they may have because you know Peter, he always opened mouth, insert foot, okay? But they thought when Jesus went through Samaria, why is Jesus wasting our time? When they went into Sychar, they probably went in there whistling, thinking, okay, y'all watch, watch around. Everybody watch, 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 watch. They're, going, they're probably going to kill us while we're in here. Jesus brought us this place. They, they, they probably thought, this is the last place on the planet that there'll be any harvest for Jesus. And yet verse 39 says, many of the Samaritans believed on him. Do you understand this morning at the most unlikely place, at the most unlikely time, you may have the privilege to share the gospel with someone. They may receive, they may not receive. It, it, may, be, it, may, be at the, it may be at the break room, it may be on lunch tomorrow. They may be walking down the street and just meet some stranger you've never met before. And you just reaching in your pocket and saying, listen, can I give you an invite to Beacon Baptist Church? And, oh, I'm interested in that. What's that, what's that about? And they may even flip the track over and look on the back side of it. Oh, the Bible way to heaven. How do you, how do you get to heaven? I've, I've wondered that. Listen to me. Every person has a part. Here's, here's what Paul said. 1 Corinthians 3, 6. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. The, the, the words there in verse 38, labor and labored, talk about in spite of the difficulties. 
these missionaries we have with us this week, they're going to share with us all that God's doing, where they're at, or what they believe God will do when they get there. Listen to me. Listen to me. They all face difficulties you and I don't even understand, first of all. But you face difficult. I'm, listen, witnessing for Jesus is not the easiest thing to do on the planet. If it was, everybody would line up today and we couldn't print enough tracks to keep the literature racks filled. But, but we're not to do it because it's easy. We're not to do it because we're going to reap. We're not to do it because we're going to receive reward. We're to do it because we're going to be obedient to Jesus who said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you all way, even to the end of the world. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. And every creature as my Father has sent me, even so sin I you. But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. It's difficult, preacher. Somebody got mad at me. Somebody spit on me. If that's the worst you ever endure for Jesus, you ought to rejoice and be exceeding glad. One of the great pastors of the last century in um, England was Francis Dixon. Dixon, in the church he pastored, asked a young man by the name of Peter if he would share his testimony one night in the service. Peter stood up and said, Pastor has asked me to share my testimony with you. He said, I was in the Royal Navy. I was stationed in Sydney, Australia. I was walking down George Street one day when a little old white-haired man came up to me and said, Excuse me, sir. I would ask you a question. If you were to die today, would you spend eternity in heaven or hell? Think about it, would you please? To-do. He said, I could never get away from it. I got back to Britain and I found a Christian who could show me how to be saved. And I trusted Christ. Not long after that, Dr. Dixon had a revival team to come to his church and preach an extended crusade. And in that revival meeting, evangelistic meeting, there was a young man of that team by the name of Noel who gave his testimony one night. He stood behind the pulpit, same pulpit Peter had stood behind not too many weeks before. And he said, I was stationed in Sydney, Australia when I was in the Royal Navy. I was walking down George Street one day when a little white-haired man came up to me and said, Excuse me, sir, may I ask you a question? If you were to die today, where would you spend eternity? There's heaven or hell, two choices. Think about it, sir. Would you please? To do. Peter went and found Noel after the service and said, That's my exact testimony. Dr. Dixon was so impressed by those two testimonies he was preaching In Australia, a few months later, in a Baptist church in Adelaide, he told the testimonies of those two young men. And while he was speaking, a man stood up and said, Dr. Dixon, may I speak? He said, yes, sir, what it is? What is it? He said, sir, I too am a convert of a little white old, little old white haired man on George Street. He went to the other side of the continent of Australia to Perfta. He shared those stories after the service. A deacon came up to him and said, Dr. Dixon, I too was walking down George Street when a little old white-haired man asked me the same question, and I too trusted Christ. He got back to England. He was preaching in a Bible conference told the story, and after the service, another man came and shared the same story. Sometime later, he was preaching to missionaries in India, which we have a couple of families from. And in the country of India, Dr. Dixon told the same story. And one of the missionaries there said, Dr. Dixon, I'm another convert. I was walking down George Street in Sydney, Australia, when that little old white-haired man approached me. He went to Jamaica, told the story, met another convert. He decided he had to go back 
to Sydney to find the little old white haired man. He asked one of his pastor friends, do you know a little old white haired man that walks down George Street speaking to people about eternity? The pastor said, oh, yes, sir. He said, that's Mr. Jenner. He said, could I see him? He said, oh, he said he's real aged now and bedridden. But I think I can get permission from his family to allow you to visit with him. He walked into the bedroom where Brother Jenner was laying, introduced himself, and he began to tell the stories of Peter and Noel and the missionary in India and the couple of folks in Australia and the missionary in Jamaica. He began to relay those stories. And he said as he did, tears began to flow down the cheeks of Mr. Jenner. And finally, in a feeble voice, he looked up at him. And he said, I never knew that I even had one convert. One soweth and another reapeth. But both he that soweth and he that reapeth receive wages. You know why? Because harvest work requires partnership. Who have you allowed God to use in their life your witness? Well, I'd do it, Pastor, if I knew they was all going to get saved. <laughs> You'll never do it then. But the law of the harvest is there's a passion we must seize. There's a people we must see. And there's a partnership we must share. Would you bow your heads with me?